So I, it was actually interesting that Rick asked me to talk about this because about a year ago at the European Hematology Association, I was asked to give a talk on, on the American perspective for treating 17P deleted CLL or mutated. And John Gribben was going to give the European approach. And the, the backstory to this and why we were asked to do this is that there is a group in Europe ERIC, which is the European Research Initiative in CLL, who are a group of investigators from different European countries that get together to do uh, CLL work and trials. And they were trying to design a randomized trial using one of the new novel agents as the experimental arm in, in 17P deleted CLL. And a big fight broke out amongst the group over what the standard arm would be. And it more or less came down to a group of Europeans who wanted to use FCR and a group of Europeans who wanted to use Campath or alentuzumab based therapy. And so that was the backstory to why they were asking myself and John Gribben to give, give the talk to try and kind of provide some perspective on this. So when I started to think about it, I thought, well, I really don't know what is the American perspective on treating 17P deleted CLL. So I actually did a little survey. And I asked nine physicians, this is through email, that I knew in private practice, and 21 physicians and academics in the US and Canada. And the question was, if you have a patient with CLL requiring treatment, that patient has 17P deletion, what would you use? And I said, you can't answer clinical trial. So I'm going to show you what they actually said. And I split it up to see would there be a difference between private practice and, and academics. So in private practice, there were nine. And I will say there was a geographic um, selection. Why? Because I'm from Houston, and that's where I tend to know people. Um, and you can see how it broke out. Most of it was fludarabine-based of the nine, a little bit for BR, and two people said alemtuzumab-based. Then when I asked the 21 people in academics, it was interesting because a lot of them made a distinction on their choice would be based on the size of the lymph nodes. And so if the lymph nodes were large, fludarabine-based one, SMNR is solumedrol and rituximab. But if the lymph nodes were small, fludarabine-based still one, but it was much more of a split, as you can see, uh, almost equal between fludarabine-based and alemtuzumab-based. And an important caveat is many of them said, and then I would try and get the patient to stem cell transplant, which is historically what we've done. This is really the only group of patients where we've recommended stem cell transplant and first remission, and that, that may be changing. Um, so where, where did the concept come from, in fact, that alemtuzumab would be a good therapy for patients with 17P deletion? Well, this was actually a German trial that was a phase two trial, essentially redoing the pivotal trial that led to alemtuzumab approval. And the pivotal trial was using IV alemtuzumab in patients who were fludarabine refractory. And so they did essentially the same trial with the distinction that they gave the fludarabine sub-Q. So these are all, by definition, fludarabine refractory patients. And notice now in a refractory population, 17P deletion, which is not that common in a frontline population, is very common in a refractory population. And in fact, what they showed is that, they, if anything, of all these, again, fludarabine refractory patients, the 17Ps tended to have the best response. And, and that's where the idea came, well, maybe it would work. And it kind of made sense, because we know that chemo doesn't make sense uh, because of the lack of P53 and the need for P53 for chemotherapy to be, at, to, to be active. And that wouldn't be relevant in terms of an antibody response. This was the CAM-307 trial. And this was a large randomized trial of alemtuzumab versus corambucil. And the reason for this trial was that when alemtuzumab got accelerated approval, in the United States, the FDA always then requires the company to go on to do a randomized confirmatory study. And this was the randomized confirmatory study that they came up with. And there used to be a joke about why this trial didn't accrue very well. And the joke was there's two reasons why the CAM-307 doesn't accrue well. One is alemtuzumab, and the other is chlorambucil. Um, but anyway, this trial did accrue mostly in Eastern Europe, where they really use trials as a way to, to get drugs to their patients. 
Um, and you can see that the alemtuzumab was better, and that's about what you would get, in fact, with single-agent fludarabine, but of course, by this time, we were beyond single-agent fludarabine. But the real um, reason that people were actually interested in the outcome of this trial was not the efficacy so much. It was what, what happens to the 17 p deleted patients. And there's already a hint when you look at the response rates that mm, maybe they're not quite doing as good as the non-17P deleted who got alemtuzumab, albeit better with alemtuzumab than chlorambucil. But here was the really disappointing piece of information. The median PFS with alemtuzumab was 10.7 months. Remember, this is a frontline trial. So keep that number in mind, about 11 months with alemtuzumab. Well, is FCR any better? Um, this is the MD Anderson data looking at FCR, and Rick showed you some of this. And now this is looking at several FCR-based regimens that we've used and looking at the outcome in 17P. And you can see that there is a dramatic reduction in complete response rate in comparison to all of the other non-17P-based groups. So obviously, FCR is not ideal. What if we go to the German data? Well, here are the PFS curves, and the dismal black curve that drops almost immediately are the 17P patients. So clearly, FCR is not looking that good. And in fact, if you draw your line across from the 50% on the 17P, you get to 12. So we've got 11 months with alemtuzumab and 12 months with FCR. So now you can understand why everybody's fighting, because in fact, they're the same, um, but both pretty lousy. Well, one of the things that also works in 17P deleted are, um, are steroids, because again, you don't need steroids to, have to, to work through P53. So two different groups said, let's see if we can put steroids and alemtuzumab together and get more, more bang for the buck. So this is the CLL20 trial where the, everybody gets alemtuzumab and decadron. You can see the dexamethasone doses at the bottom. Um, they get them in four-week bursts if they are, and then they could go on to maintenance with alentuzumab or transplant. and I'm not going to talk about that part of the trial. The other trial was the CAMPRED trial that has recently been published, and this is from the British. And here they used, as you can see, whopping doses of methylprednisone, a gram per meter squared daily for five days, along with alentuzumab. And here are the results of the trials also showing you the CAM-307, which is alemtuzumab alone, and the FCR from the CLL-8 trial. And so, yeah, if you look at the last column, the CAM-PRED seems to have a higher CR rate, but it doesn't really translate into very much. So it looks like both the trials with the steroids gets you maybe to 18 months. So you got an extra six months. Again, that's still really awful in a frontline trial. And there's a, that, these regimens are not easy to give. Um, you can see here that you get myelosuppression, you get infections, you get CMV reactivation, and just from the high doses of steroids on that uh, solumedrol trial, you can see 23% grade 3 to 4 uh, problems steroid-related, myopathy, hyperglycemia, et cetera. So the other thing that was interesting about the fact that people were arguing so vociferously about what was the best control arm is that in all the trials I've shown you, which are pretty, pretty much it, this is the total number of frontline 17P patients that are represented, 90. But the bottom line is, if there was a clear, obvious standard of care, people wouldn't be arguing. So the fact that they're arguing tells you there really isn't a standard of care, nothing is good, and it's just what the favorite regimen that person has that day. Now, what I think is going to change this is, is, as you, is some of the newer agents. And I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of some of these newer agents in the 17P deleted patients. Um, you heard about ibrutinib from Rick. This is a patient of mine with an 11Q deletion. I just threw this in to point out to you quite obviously how dramatic these lymph node responses are in these patients. He showed you the overall response rates are very high. And here's the data for the 17P. So if the overall response rate with ibrutinib in the relapse refractory is 71%, 68% for the 17P, so no different. So that's pretty exciting. It appears to be working even in that group, but is it really working as well? Well, in fact, if you look at the progression-free survival curves, they're not quite as good as the non-17P, non-11Q, and the relapse refractory curve is B. 
However, what I would tell you is that that PFS curve that you're seeing for the 17P patients um, is better, okay, than any frontline PFS curve that I've shown you. And this is a patient with a median of four prior regimens. Better than any frontline PFS curve and better than any survival curve published for relapse 17P patients. What about idelalisib? Is it just ibrutinib? This one also very dramatic, very rapid reduction in lymph nodes. And you might also notice that um, this drug improves hairstyles. <laughs> if this has been given um, in frontline with rituximab for patients over the age of 65. And in that trial, there were seven, nine patients with deletion 17P or P53 mutation. Not that many because, again, this is frontline. 100% of them responded. There has so far been no patient that has yet progressed on this trial. So the drops in the curves there that you see were some deaths on study. The PFS at 24 months is 93%, and not one of the 17P patients has yet relapsed. That's the red curve along the top. And then finally, I wanted to also mention ABT199, the BCL2 inhibitor. So this isn't a B cell receptor inhibitor, but it's another oral agent. We see very dramatic reduction in lymph nodes with this drug, lymphocyte counts, and interestingly, bone marrow infiltration, which you don't see very early with the B cell receptor inhibitors. But what about the 17 Ps? Well, on this relapse refractory phase one trial, there are 17 patients with 17P deletion, and the overall response rate is, is 82%. So in conclusion, I think it's very clear that in patients with 17P, we're going to we're, that's the one group where we're very quickly going to get rid of chemotherapy. And um, the small molecule inhibitors are going to be the treatment of choice. I suspect not as single agents because you don't see high CR rates, but clearly the therapy going forward is going to be based on these agents and not chemo. Thank you for your attention.